welcome to the uh, the folk who uh, are here for the first time, and uh, welcome back for those who've been here yesterday. I think we can promise you a very interesting um, session today with uh, a variety of different things to uh, to attend to. The first uh, up this morning, um, we're very pleased to welcome um, Martin, uh, Martin Ling, uh, M0LNG, and uh, He'll be talking to us a little bit more about uh, some interesting developments for the future of transponders. Now we've been we've been very kind of used to the old bent pipe type uh, transponders uh, that would regurgitate whatever um, uplink signal we could manage and uh, regurgitate it back down on a different uh, frequency. Um, but that need not be the nature of the future, and uh, we'll be finding out a little bit more about that uh, through there. Um, it's uh, it's an interesting concept and one that I think we can look to interesting to, to develop over the uh, the coming years. So um, so that's where we're starting from. Um, after that, uh, after our coffee break, uh, we'll be uh, Ian Young will be taking us uh, into uh, a few degrees of automation in terms of uh, how can we uh, follow all our little satellites and uh, various other um, features, APRS and various other features that uh, our satellites offer us, but on an automated uh, basis. And uh, <coughs> after lunch, we might have a treat. Um, we're not quite sure about what might be happening, but uh, we could be following a SpaceX launch um, live on air if, um, if they choose to go. <laughs> There's always a big doubt on that. Um, but uh, if that gets scrubbed for whatever reason, uh, we'll be looking forward to uh, hearing Heather Nichols uh, give us a bit of a chat about high altitude ballooning. So in the mix of things here, we've got a quite a, a variety of different things to, uh, to offer for today. So without any more ado, can I welcome uh, Martin to come along and uh, give us uh, a quick talk about your interesting developments. Can you hear me? Okay, good morning. Uh, so I'm going to go through how on earth I ended up here giving a talk in the hangover slot at the Amtec UK colloquium, um, why I might want us to have SDR transponders and some things we might do with them, uh, a little bit about what I'm trying to do in terms of adapting that concept to Funcube, um, and then some sort of next steps in hardware development. Um, I didn't really start out as a radio ham. Um, I know many of you decades of experience on the air, um, but my background was in sort of R&D projects, first in academia, then commercial yeah. things, doing electronics, firmware, a bit of signal analysis, model fitting, that kind of thing, and then manufacturing. Ended up having to solve EMC problems, but didn't really have a radio background. Um, and when I did come into that, um, I found myself more interested in the design and the equipment than in actually sort of talking on the air. So you probably won't have heard my call sign kicking around that much. Um, during sort of COVID period, um, I sort of needed a side project to occupy myself. And a friend of mine had been, you know, showing off making satellite contact in the park with a handheld and a, uh, a Yagi that he'd built. And um, I thought, this looks quite interesting. I should have a go at it. And then I'll try the hardest possible way to do it, which is I'll design an SDR to do it. Um, rather, because I um, started looking at, you know, what was available in terms of equipment, especially radios that could do full okay. duplex. And there's fewer and fewer things uh, available. So I, I uh, worked on this design, which was uh, a two meter and 70 centimeter front end to go in front of a uh, an SDR design that uh, my friend Mike had uh, built called Amalfia, which was based on this Atmel 886 RF215 chip that's a 2.4 gig and sort of sub 1 gig uh, dual band uh, part. Um, and I was still sort of fiddling that design when I came to EMF in 2022, I met the AMSAT UK uh, team who were there. Um, and then uh, Graham invited me to come and give a talk and then participate in the the Funcube group, and uh, then ended up at last year's colloquium. And uh, so there's been a sort of process of figuring out, you know, what I might be able to do to sort of help um, with, uh, with with any of these projects. Um, and then a lot of sort of back and forth with some very patient folk on the Funcube team, um, dealing with uh, a couple of years of me showing up on calls and asking silly questions and having silly ideas. Um, at last year's uh, colloquium, um, remember 
uh, Frank Zeffenfeld's talk. He was talking about the ESA uh, proposal to uh, do a new GEO payload uh, for amateur radio. And uh, one of these sort of questions that came up in the sort of uh, questions he was putting to the community about what do people want was, do we want analog, do we want digital, or do we want an SDR in space? And this led to some debate in discussions that followed. And uh, a lot of folks seem to feel that these were sort of mutually exclusive things. And if we went for some of the new options, then we would lose the benefits of the good old bent pipes that we uh, are familiar with. And uh, I ended up um, sort of in response to this, writing this article called Beyond the Bent Pipe, which came out in Oscar News last December, um, sort of advocating for a sort of mixed approach to this. Uh, that ended up included in the AMSAT UK proposal to ESA. And um, AMSAT DL, when they put their proposal in, have similar ideas about doing something a bit beyond um, a bent pipe. So when I talk about SDR transponders, I'm not advocating for we replace everything that we used to do with that. I'm advocating about uh, we do both, right? So um, and, and to the greatest extent possible, we reuse designs that we already know work. So um, a pure SDR transponder would be something of the sort where you replace the, the IF stage in a conventional sort of bent pipe linear transponder with conversion down to baseband, ADC, some processing and software, DAC out to a uh, up conversion down to the downlink frequency. Um, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm talking about having both available essentially in part of the same transponder operating in sort of different sub bands within the uplink and downlink. And, um, a lot of interesting properties about this in that, you know, the uplink and downlink can be now asymmetric in that you can have a wider range of frequencies that you're listening for signals coming up in, even if you've got a narrow downlink and you can be combining different things coming down. You can be having the SDR listen in for stuff that's coming up on the, the neotransponder bandwidth and picking out things of interest and maybe adding them to the telemetry or things like that. There's a lot of combinations you could do. Um, so in terms of sort of different scenarios that you might um, want to use this for to do new things, um, one of them I talked about in that paper was uh, effectively regeneration, right? So you have the satellite detect, demodulate, and decode a signal that's coming up. Um, and then uh, rather than just retransmitting the analog signal that it received, regenerate that in the same form and send it down, but now your, your sort of SNR is reset and you get the benefits of coding gain on the way up and coding gain on the way down. Um, and if you're in a you know, situation where your link budget is marginal on one side or the other, um, then uh, that may let you make, make contact when you couldn't before. Uh, the other thing you can do quite easily because the satellites decoded the signal, all it has to do is store you know, what it decoded, not the whole um, waveform, is sort of store and forward, um, which obviously this is not a new idea either. This has been done back to the old AX25 uh, days. Um, but uh, you know, not necessarily storing and forwarding um, quite some time later over a different part of, part of the orbit, but even just things like making the communication half duplex. So you transmit up with your handheld and rather than needing a, another handheld or a second radio to listen for yourself on the downlink, um, you, you, the, the satellite would just wait till you're finished transmitting and then echo your signal back down to you. And that makes it easier for people to do things with cheap crappy radios, which is uh, you know how we help people get into the hobby. Um, another thing we can do is boss mode. So. You transmit up in one mode on one band, and the you know when the, that uh, message is transmitted down uh, on the downlink, um, it could be in a different mode, um, maybe something that's more appropriate to the other band, right? Um, especially you know, if we're talking about doing stuff in VHF, UHF, L-band, microwave stuff. You know, it doesn't necessarily make sense to use the same modulations and encodings on uh, both uh, sides of the link. Um, we can also uh, do aggregation, right? So um, one uh, digital transponder that's uh, been up recently is the Green Cube one. And a problem that you may have run into if you tried to use that was that it was effectively a queue of people trying to get into it all on the same 
frequency. Um, but if you've got a, a software-defined receiver listening to a sort of range of bandwidth around the uplink frequency, you can potentially have multiple transmissions coming up at the same time. The satellite can aggregate those messages together and trans transmit all of them in one downlink signal. Um, and uh, that, that uh, can help. One of the big benefits of all of this is it can help the power budget on the satellite. Uh, if you look at what uh, Funky One is doing right now, um, it's got telemetry running, it's got the linear transponder running, and most of the time, it's spending a lot of power running the PA just to transmit a noise floor on the linear transponder. You know, so if we can make um, the satellite able to identify when there is a signal coming up, when there is actually anything worth transmitting back down, we can turn that PA off you know, when we don't need it. Um, or we can uh, you know, turn down the noise floor on the, the linear transponder or, or, or different things like that. And um, you know, so some power spent on doing signal processing in, electronic, in software you know, may pay for itself in terms of saving power that we would otherwise have spent on the PA from the satellite's power budget. Um, other sorts of things we might be able to do is um, listening for things that maybe aren't necessarily directed specifically to the satellite. Um, uh, like uh, you know, looking for beacons, um, maybe balloons like Heather's going to talk about possibly later. Um, right now, those balloon payloads are generally using APRS on two meters, so it wouldn't be compatible with like the, the FUNQ 70 centimeter uplink. But it, it's the sort of thing that can be done, and um, it's, uh, there's a lot of potential for sort of newer, weaker, weak signal, heavily coded modes to be used as, as beacons and have satellites look for them and report which ones they've seen in their telemetry downlinks. Um, another part of the sort of ideas I'm exploring here is, um, well, it's got a bit messed up, but uh, one of the constraints with doing things in software is uh, you may want to update that software. Right. And the benefit of doing things in software-defined radio is uh, you, 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 can, you can go and change the function of the thing, but how do you do that when the device is in, in orbit? Uh, you need a way to upload new code to it, and if you're thinking about um, CubeSats and so on, then your, your bandwidth and your ability to send new code to it is quite limited. Um, but we have the advantage in the amateur community of a whole network of um, people with ground stations um, and so we can potentially do things like the entire time the satellite's going around its orbit, you know, anybody who is interested in that satellite and doing something like running the FunCube dashboard to receive data from it um, could also be sending data back up to it. And so you can distribute the work of, of uploading um, new code that you want to deploy to the satellite uh, as part of that. There's a lot of work you need to do to ensure the sort of integrity and the authenticity of that, that, that data, but that is all relatively straightforward to do in, in software. Um, so when this conversation started in the concept of the ESA geo proposal, it was about doing uh, SDR in what's probably a fairly large satellite payload, something along the lines of what's on QO100, which uh, you know, obviously there's a, a fair bit of power behind that transponder on a fairly big satellite. So in that kind of environment, you uh, could probably put some sort of Linux-based computer on there. You may even be able to have um, a GPU for offloading some of the, the heavy uh, computation work. Um, and the result would be something that is fairly easy for amateurs on the ground to develop software for, contribute programs that, that, that could be submitted for evaluation and maybe being you know, deployed into space. Um, and in, in that kind of payload, hopefully you'd have enough, you know, bandwidth in the uh, sort of control channels, the satellite, uh, to, to manage that and be able to send updates to it and so on. That would all be quite exciting. It would be a great thing to have. Um, but what about doing it on a CubeSat? Um, and that adds a whole lot more constraints. Um, obviously, primarily the power budget. Um, 
also you know physically how much board area you have to put put those components on um, another aspect there is heat dissipation you run CPUs they get quite hot um, even if you can handle the power consumption you can't necessarily dissipate the heat um, so you're going to be constrained to a lot less computational power to do anything with these signals uh, your um, uh, bandwidth and the sizes of sort of messages that you can get up to it in the space of a pass is quite limited and you've got to think about how you're going to integrate that um, into the overall CubeSat design without adding uh, all of unnecessary risk to the mission. Um, so the sorts of solutions <coughs> that I'm thinking about here um, is that this would be a, you know, a microcontroller based thing um, probably with an FPGA for some offload of some of, some of the heavier computation work, uh, which is going to be a much more difficult thing to develop for, um, at least with how it's been done more traditionally. There's some things in the pipeline in the software world that may make that easier. Um, it needs to be to a very limited bandwidth because we just won't have the, the computational power to crunch more you know, sample rate than that. Um, it would need to be, you know, effectively a sort of a, a payload on the satellite that is sort of, you know, completely under the control of the main command and control system on the satellite. Um, we can't rely on the main control control system link for um, updates, so it would need to have the code on it to receive its own updates and decode them and so on itself. Um, you want to minimize the amount of code you, you have to send to it. Um, so you'd be splitting that uh, code into different regions and try and reuse modules. You know, so you have a bit of code that does an FFT and you don't change that. You upload different things that use it in different ways. And obviously you need um, ways to make sure that anything you do upload to it is, is what was intended and authorized to be uploaded. So you have crypto hashes and signing keys and so forth. Um, there are some projects around trying to do things like this. Um, back in December, I met some of the Libra Space folks at the CCC Congress in Hamburg, and they had the, one of these boards with them, the Satnogs comms uh, board. And actually, this is interestingly similar to the thing I showed you at the very start of the talk. It's got that same Atmel chip in it. Um, so it's uh, L-band and uh, UHF, sorry, S-band and UHF. Um, uh, radio with a uh, microcontroller, an FPGA. Um, they're sort of targeting this, you know, to be the sort of main uh, communication system for a satellite with fairly um, wide bandwidth and high um, link speeds, I think up to um, one megabit per second of data rate on, on S band. So this is a fairly um, power heavy design. I think this is up to eight watts in transmit. Um, so this is not the sort of thing um, I'm talking about here, but it's another example of trying to do SDR in a CubeSat form factor. Um, so what I've been looking at is how could we sort of retrofit a sort of minimal version of this into essentially the FunCube design um, for uh, targeting FunCube Next, the 2U uh, mission. Um, so this is a block diagram of the uh, RF board that's up on Funky One right now, um, and if I pull up the uh, put, put it on its side, the diagram of the sort of overall architecture that you know aiming for here. Uh, we already have some of the elements here, in that you've got your uplink coming in through here, going through a couple of down conversions. So you've got a 10.7 meg IF stage here where it splits um, to two branches, one to the linear transponder, one to the FM receiver that's part of the ground and control. Um, and so uh, that is the point at which we'd want to you know, tap off it. Um, and then for a downlink, we'd want to tap in um, down somewhere like here, um, where we're taking you know, the telemetry feed the Neo transponder feed and combining them. You know, so this is an idea that fits quite closely into what is already happening in the FunCube design. 
Um, there's some questions about exactly where you tap, like do you go after that crystal filter or do you have a slightly different crystal filter to have a different bandwidth for the um, uh, SDR subsystem than you do for the, uh, the linear transponder? And do you come out at the IF stage before this mixer or do you come out at the RF stage after that mixer? Um, David's recommendation was that we look at the coming out at RF. So this is a sort of block diagram of what uh, my sort of proposed approach at the moment is. So you come in at 10.7 megahertz. Um, so you've already had the benefit of the two down conversions, the IF amps, all the filtering that was around those. So you've got a pretty tight, clean, you know, maybe 20, 30 megahertz, 20, 30 kilohertz of uh, bandwidth at your IF frequency. Um, we're now basically building an HF receiver, right? Um, so uh, a very popular way to do that is with uh, Dan Taylor's style of um, a quadrature sample detector, which takes you straight to um, uh, baseband INQ. Um, and then uh, there's a number of designs out there that, that uh, then use ADCs that are essentially designed for audio applications. Um, so have, you know, typically 48 kilohertz of bandwidth. So this is if you've looked at an MCHF or any of the designs like that, that kind of thing. And uh, the digital side of that is an I squared S bus, which is a, a serial uh, bus specifically for transferring digital audio um, sort of within uh, designs. Um, uh, the DAC is the sort of inverse of that um, to the TX side and uh, the idea we have at the moment is to use one of these linear tech 5599 chips, which is a direct IQ modulator that would take that baseband straight up to one point uh, to 145 ish meg to go into the combined towards the PA. Um, on the processing side, um, this would be a microcontroller, probably something like the SM STM32. Um, the higher end one of those ones of those like the F7 or H7 series, which you can clock at a couple of hundred megahertz. And that sort of thing is already able to do um, quite a bit on its own. There's been some demos of doing FT8 decoding on a I think STM32 F7, um, uh, not with the same you know, level of success as you know, what you can do on a PC, but still able to do some quite significant work. Um, and I want to pair that with an FPGA, a small low power uh, one, uh, ICE 40 from Lattice, uh, which um, uh, gives us a way to take, you know, certain, certain tasks that are expensive, like the LDPC decoding for some of the digital modes, and move that into digital logic, so with some RAM attached. And so from the point of view of the rest of the, the satellite, this is just another thing that we control over I2C, and have a switch that turns it on and off, right? And the control will be very simple, like run program one, run program two, run program three, or turn off, you know? So, so we're not adding complexity to the management of the satellite, but within those programs, this could be doing things like receiving a new program that's being sent up for the, from the ground. So you have effectively a sort of bootloader program that could be selected, um, that can, when it's fully transferred, then be be run on this. Um, so uh, I've been working on sort of trying to flesh that design out. Um, and one of the questions in, in doing that that I ran into was, what's the power level at this point? And it turns out that's quite a good question because well, it, we know the gain of all this, but you know, when the thing's actually in the space, how much power do we actually see at the antenna? Um, and uh, so what do we know? Um, so when uh, Funky Bomb was being tested on the ground, you know, uh, sort of confirmed that uh, you could get into it with a signal at about minus 115 dBm in SSB bandwidth at the antenna. Um, but if we're trying to do uh, things in the SDR where we're trying to sort of pull signals out with lots of coding gain from almost under the noise floor, we might be interested in you know, looking at signals that are quite a bit below that. So we might want to look down to maybe 135 dBm or even below. Um, we know that the 
the gain control kicks in um, when the signal at the antenna gets to about minus 90 dBm, but that gain control is here in the linear transponder. So that is after we'd be talking about tapping it off. So um, we wouldn't have the benefit of that AGC, and in fact, I don't see that AGC as a benefit um, if you're trying to demodulate signals digitally. Um, anything that's sort of messing with the signal level um, is just an extra variable that you have to account for. Much better to have the dynamic range to see the whole thing. Um, so I, I, I was doing a bit of research on uh, you know what sort of signal level might we see in space, and it turns out people have uh, looked at this and, and, and tried to map it out. So this is um, from a paper that came out a couple of years ago, um, looking at uh, radio interference in the 70 centimeter band from the Serpent satellite. Um, so they uh, collected uh, sort of signal strength data over the course of a lot of orbits, I think over 2015, 2016, um, and mapped it out. And, uh, you know, I haven't managed to do the math to figure out exactly how these signal levels might map to what you'd expect to see on Funky. We'd have to account for all the differences in their signal path and ours and uh, the, um, the different antenna types and so on. Um, but it might be kind of broadly, broadly in the same ballpark in, in the sense that, um, you know, in uh, quiet uh, areas, if we can find we can get in at minus 115, well, yeah, we're above that noise floor by a few dB. Um, and, uh, but you see uh, the worst case spots of this, and it's a bit more obvious in this, this other plot, um, are <laughs> quite a number of dBs above that. And uh, this satellite they were measuring it on um, wasn't going up, di didn't have enough inclination to be going up to the latitudes where it, it actually gets even worse. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, we're in this situation where we might be wanting to look at signals from sort of down here somewhere um, whilst there's noise up here somewhere, you know, possibly you know, right next to it. So we do want quite a lot of dynamic range in this thing. Um, and the, uh, uh, there probably is quite a lot of analog dynamic range at that stage of the signal path, because this is before all the gain in the linear transponder. Um, so I've been uh, working on that uh, receiver design. Um, it looks something like this. So you've got, um, you know, 50 ohm uh, input that's, this would be on a, a little coax feed from the RF board, um, coming into a uh, transformer to a differential. You've got your um, quadrature sample detector. So this is uh, switching four phases of a clock to sample the signal at different points. Um, and you end up with differential signals coming out that you're in Q. Um, we have some gain here because even at the sort of top end of the expected range, we're likely to be a bit short of what you need to sort of fill the ADC range. Um, you also fit some filtering into that as well. So you're helping take the edges off anything that's strong that might be sort of just outside the IF filter. Um, and uh, the idea with this is to bring that sort of 20, 20 kilohertz of bandwidth not uh, all the way down to DC, but offset by a bit, um, because uh, if you've worked with any quadrature sampling SDR receiver, you'll know there's a spike in the middle where you've got the yellow bleed through, you've got the uh, DC offset. Um, you don't want that right in the middle of your pass band. Um, so the thinking here is we might have this sampling at say 48 kilohertz, um, uh, and uh, so you'd um, filter this down to maybe 30 kilohertz um, and you have your LO frequency for this sampling detector offset by 12. So at DC you have, um, well, yeah, a baseband, you have the sort of signal of interest sitting here um, and it's been through the IF filter that's there and this filter and then you've got this out the way, which also means that the LO frequency from this and its harmonics aren't interfering with the other stuff that cares about that LO elsewhere on the satellite. Um, 
So this is the one part of the design that's um, basically complete. Um, and uh, the other side, the, um, the output side, is, is, is really a lot simpler. There's not much complexity of that. We know what signal level we want going into the, um, uh, into the downlink side. The hard part, really, is what you do in the middle. Right? Um, now, to actually make this do anything, we need to do write an awful lot of code. Um, and there's a bit of a sort of um, chicken and egg problem here in that I'm simultaneously trying to design, you know, what the hardware that that runs on <laughs> looks like, exactly how it's put together, how much power it draws, and so on. And um, unlike analog stuff where you, you build it, you turn it on, you make sure it works, and you see how much power it draws on the meter, okay, good, that's fine. Um, with digital, it, it all depends what you're doing, right? So um, you, you can't really see if this is going to do what we want at the power budget we want, until you've written all the code to make it do the thing you want. Um, so um, I'm at the stage at the moment of sort of trying to find what the smoothest path is to being able to, to develop that. And that's also you know, not just about making it easy for me, but um, uh, we want other people to be able to contribute software to this. So um, you know, it needs to be something that's tractical to, to develop. Um, I got stuck on this for a long time. And meanwhile, I was distracted by projects we were doing at work that was taking up a lot of my time. And then eventually I realized, oh, no, I can use the work project <laughs> to fill this gap in the middle. Um, so this is what uh, we've been building at um, Great Scott Gadgets lately, uh, which is a USB uh, capture and analysis and development tool. Um, and uh, it can be used for various things. But it's got a couple of um, PMOD ports on it. It's based on an FPGA. Uh, it's based on the same FPGA that we're using in some SDR radio projects. Um, and uh, because of the gateway libraries and so on that we've got, I can quite easily take that, make it be a USB audio device, hook it up to GNU radio, and run the RX side of this into GNU radio and the TX side of it out of GNU radio or whatever other software on um, PC and work on pushing parts of the processing pipeline into the FPGA, which is uh, another topic we've been sort of looking at in terms of how do we make that easier, like up to the point, uh, some work my colleague Mike did, which is about, um, uh, you know, you have your blocks in GNU radio, you have your FPGA based SDR connected, and you literally just push the blocks into the FPGA. And uh, there is some of that working, although it's a, it needs a lot more work. Um, that's also a direction that um, I think uh, the GNU Radio folks are sort of moving towards with some of the GNU Radio 4 architecture. Uh, so it's going to become easier to do things like that. And there is an increasing amount of stuff um, being done now uh, for signal processing on FPGAs and FPGAs with the open tool chains. Um, uh, many of you will know Daniel Estevez um, and the Maya SDR thing that he's done for the Pluto. That's all written in Amaranth, which is the same Python-based hardware description language that we're using in these kinds of projects. Um, so, okay, that's kind of how I'm approaching this. What sort of things might we um, want to implement with it? Um, well, the requests I have from the Funcube team at the moment are dead simple BPSK at um, you know, 1200 or, or higher board rates. That's sort of our baseline thing we might want to do um, as your sort of fail safe, probably the, the, the most basic way of uploading software and configuration changes to something like this as well with something based on that. Um, and in terms of doing that on SDR, it would be not just about, you know, demo find, demodulate and decode that, but do so when there's other strong signals in the passband, can you still find the interesting BPSK thing down here when there's a big bit of noise here can you find multiple ones at once? Can you uh, do those in parallel? That sort of thing. Um, the other thing that people are keen on is weak signal modes like FT8, FT4. FT4 is a bit more preferable for satellite uh, work because of the faster conversations. These are quite tricky to do on LEO sats um, uh, because they're very sensitive to Doppler shift. If you look at um, FT8 signal, it's 8 FSK, you've got eight, eight little tones, 
uh, that signal is made up of, and they're 6.25 hertz apart. And um, it's not so much the Doppler shift, but the rate of change of the Doppler shift, the slope on the waterfall, um, is what makes these uh, difficult uh, to, to deal with. And even if you're sort of compensating for that with tracking and so on, um, the, the, if your clock is off by a bit, if your TLEs are off by a bit, um, even that can be enough to, to, to mess it up. Um, and uh, so something I'm looking at is, can we put the necessary intelligence in the satellite side to have it figure out the Doppler um, and decode this with those effects um, included? Um, another f uh, question is, you know, is that a right approach or, or is there the opportunity to do something new here that's actually sort of optimised for the LEO QSO case? Um, something that's, you know, desired for robustness against Doppler, maybe P PSK or MSK-based rather than FSK so that it's easier to track what the overall sort of curve of a signal is. Um, I've got some ideas about how we might sort of lock to that efficiently by having a preamble that sort of chirps at different slopes and you look for something straight and that tells you both that you found something and also which part of the chirp it was by the fact that it's straight. Um, so um, if that's the sort of topic you're interested in, there's a couple of uh, pages that are well worth reading. One is, again, Danny Estevez um, a few years ago worked on um, testing FTA and modelling the Doppler issues with it. Um, uh, so that's a, a good thing to read. And um, this uh, page here about um, implementing a basic version of FTA in Python with NumPy and so on is a really good read if you're um, uh, interested in how this works, because it's, it's quite clever. You know, it's a very direct mapping of the sort of FFT to the decoding process and like a bin is a pixel, you're almost sort of pointing a barcode reader at it and just trying to take it out. But the hard part with these sorts of decoding things is finding where you need to look with the decoder in the first place. Um, you've got to find these signals um, by having some quick way to spot them. In FT8 it works with um, looking for these particular patterns that show up at the start and the end of the signal. Um, and when you find a pair of those, you go, OK, I'll run the decoder on what's in the middle. Um, but uh, that's obviously not going to work when the thing's slanted, when the thing's curved, and, 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 and so on. So it's, it's things like how do you adapt that? Um, and also, if we want to sort of remove the need to do the Doppler collection from the ground, and we're doing this over a 20 kilohertz bandwidth, you're now looking over almost 10 times as much bandwidth as when you do it on SSB. Um, uh, on, yeah. So uh, that's kind of where I'm at with it, and um, very happy to take any questions. Yeah. Instead of FT8. Yes. Of, everyone just use. I'm oh, sorry. Start again. Instead of FT8 and FT4, which everyone uses just because it's the most popular flavor of the month. Yes. The old JT9. Right. It seems we've got ignored. It's got some fast modes associated with it. Yes. 50, 100, 200 board burst modes. Now, I've used them through QO100, and they're absolutely wonderful. Right, yeah. For yep. the uplink. Yeah. They're burst modes, short bursts, so you, you can transmit different messages in the same transmission if you want. Yeah. And WSJT, it's all built. It's all there in the software that everyone's got. Yeah. So that would be an option. Furthermore, it's convolutionally encoded, so you can use a simple Viterbi decoder in the satellite. Far yep. simpler than trying to do FT8. Yeah. No, that's I, I'm 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 totally open to that sort of thing. I mean, the, I also had a look at um, MSK one four four, which is yeah. the meteor scatter mode, because that's obviously designed for very short yeah. bursts, and in a short burst, you don't care so much about any I've of the tried, Doppler effects. I've, I've tried it on QO one four. My my link budget won't won't work with one four four. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any more? Okay. Uh, well. Sorry. What sort of time scale are you um, envisaging? What sort of time scale am I envisaging? Oh, no, I am not committing to anything. Okay. You know, in, in, in theory, this is aimed at uh, Funcube Next. Um, 
which is in the process of moving to the right, as these things do. Um, uh, but I, I am absolutely not committing to having anything, you know, built. If I do, great. If I don't, it doesn't. I'm not, I'm not taking that risk. Uh, one question, sorry, question from Peter on the stream. Yeah. Uh, will others uh, be able to contribute and participate? Are you planning to release it as open source hardware and software? Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm fully about open source. All my stuff is open source. Um, uh, I don't have uh, those schematics up yet, but I'm happy to make those available. And yeah, if there's people who want to collaborate on this, I'd be very happy to talk to them. I'd love to have more people to work with on this. This is not something I'm precious about. It's not necessarily something I want to do by myself. Um, it's uh, it's something I've been doing by myself up to now because I'm the only one doing it. Nope. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, okay. Martin. That's been uh, quite a, a substantially deep dive into uh, some very interesting and new technologies, which uh, I think are going to be very exciting to see how this all pans out in the future. Um, challenges, certainly, um, but it's certainly a, a whole new field of, uh, of development that I think uh, we're it's one of a hobby that we've got that allows us to sort of progress into all these new technologies and time and so on. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you.